All right, we're back. Uh, actually, the final scheduled talk of the day for Birds of a Feather and food and everything else. Um, I appreciate you all braving it out. Um, I would like to uh, give a shout out to our sponsor, With Secure. Having With Secure as a partner helps you understand and address the cyber risks associated with business transformation, embedding outcome based cybersecurity measures tailored to identifying unknown unknowns and to designing mitigations. All right, this talk is I Trusted You, A Demonstrated Abuse of Cloud Kerberos Trust by Daniel Heinzman, Heinzen, and Elad Shamir. I hand it over to you guys. Thank you. All right, good afternoon. Does that sound good in the back? Yeah, we're all good? Okay, so this talk is essentially demonstrating uh, an attack from um, Azure AD Cloud to on-premises. So my name is Daniel, and this is Elad. And uh, we are uh, security researchers and service architects at SpectreOps, and we do like red teams and pen tests and stuff. So the big deal, the, the reason of this talk is to demonstrate that given that we've compromised Azure AD, that we can have a guarantee that we can compromise on-prem uh, all the way up to domain administrator, given a few things. So given that uh, Cloud Kerberos Trust is deployed, and that there's a line of sight to the on-premises domain controller. So, given those two things, and you know the mitigations haven't been employed that we're going to talk at the end, right? Um, just out of curiosity, is, is anyone here using Windows Hello for Business in their environment? Anyone? Yeah, handful. Do you know if uh, if any of you are using Cloud Kerberos Trust as your underlying mechanism for Windows Hello for Business? No, good. Good. <laughs> Actually, no, I don't want to discourage you from using it. Uh, as you'll see, well, there, there's some consequences to it, but it's, it's not that bad. So um, essentially, our goal is to convince you that um, yeah, a compromise in the cloud is equal to a compromise on-prem, and there is no boundary between the two, given these conditions. Uh, so I mentioned Cloud Kerberos Trust. Um, for those of you uh, whose first time is, you know, that this is your first time hearing that term, um, Cloud Kerberos Trust is an Azure Active Directory feature. Um, it's essentially a way to enable um, you to use legacy authentication protocols uh, without using a password. So if you're using Windows Hello for Business, um, you don't have a password, um, there needs to be a way to still authenticate to your on-premises like FileShare, which uses Kerberos, which is a password-based mechanism. So, Microsoft comes up with you know these a handful of different hacks to get uh, to get this to work, um, and Cloud Kerberos Trust is one of those. So in order to understand this attack, uh, we're going to cover three things, right? So we can't just convince you that this is a cool thing um, and say you know a job's done. Uh, we have three things that we're going to cover, um, and it is I'd say slightly heavier on technical content. So I know it's late in the day. Uh, we'll try to make it uh, zippy. Um, the first thing is Kerberos. Um, so if you're not familiar with Kerberos authentication, we're going to go over just the bare bones of how that works, right? Because that, that is a required knowledge. The second thing is read-only domain controllers, which is uh, how Cloud Kerberos Trust is implemented kind of under the hood. And then the last is uh, Azure AD sync mechanics. So um, a part of this attack, when, when we say that Cloud Kerberos, is uh, Cloud Kerberos Trust is deployed, it's implied that you have a hybrid model, right? So you have on-premises Active Directory and you have Azure AD in the cloud and users need to be synced between the two. So if I create a new user on-premises, there is a mechanism that syncs that to the cloud. So in our engagements, there's typically a way to go from cloud to on-prem just by relying on user misconfigurations, right? Like they may have taken a, an administrator and synced it up to the cloud or maybe there's a tier zero asset that you know is in tune managed or something. But we're seeing this more and more. We're seeing hybrid engagements where clients will hire us and say, you know, we want you to do a red team. And then there's always like a cloud component. And so we wanted to find new primitives that we can rely on, like a guarantee that we can go from on-prem to or uh, from cloud to on-prem and on-prem to cloud. But you know, in this case, cloud to on-prem. Um, and just a bit on passwordless authentication. So Microsoft has been really pushing this, right? Um, and it's a very good incent like incentive. Like, this is a, a really good security feature, you know, basically eliminates phishing. But 
Microsoft is beholden to its old technologies, right? And that, that's just you know fact of life. Um, and so with the legacy authentication mechanisms, um, they have to come up with creative solutions. So you may be familiar with Windows Hello for Business, which is the like the the marketing term for password lists. Um, if you log into like Windows 10 or Windows 11, um, you might log in with like a thumbprint or a pin or like an iris scan or gate recognition or whatever you want, right? Like there, there's all these plugins. What's happening under the hood is it's unlocking, it's using, it's deriving some information from your fingerprint or whatever to unlock some credential material that's bound to the device, like on the TPM, and then that's used to like sign requests or authenticate you, right? And so when you log into your laptop, that's really easy to, to talk to Azure AD through like OAuth and stuff, but there needs to be some sort of you know, bridge to implement these legacy um, authentication mechanisms over Kerberos. So there are actually two authentication mechanisms, right? And, and great engineering efforts had to have been made to kind of bridge this gap. And so I think at this point, I'm gonna hand it over to a lot and we're gonna talk about Kerberos. So good luck. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, it's fine, I'll use the computer. So Microsoft had to uh, cater for passwordless authentication. On the machine itself, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, it recognizes your face, you smile to the computer as you turn it on, it logs you in, maybe you have to enter a PIN. Uh, in order to log into remote resources, there are two scenarios. One is uh, authenticating to Azure, and again, Microsoft designed Azure to support that with APRT, uh, with OAuth, but on-prem, Microsoft is still stuck with legacy authentication protocols, namely uh, Kerberos and NTLM. Now, Kerberos and NTLM were designed back when passwords were considered cutting-edge technology. They never thought of passwordless authentication at the time. So Microsoft had to solve this problem and actually came up with three different solutions. Certificate trust, key trust, and cloud Kerberos trust, which is of course what we're going to discuss today. Certificate trust and key trust leverage an extension to the Kerberos protocol, which uh, was introduced to support smart card authentication back in the day. That's pretty similar to passwordless authentication. Cloud Kerberos Trust, though, is a completely different beast. Anyhow, ultimately, all these three deployment models allow users to obtain Kerberos tickets to authenticate to on-prem resources without ever entering their password. Kerberos, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is the primary authentication protocol for um, on-prem authentication in Active Directory environments. It is a ticket-based authentication protocol. I'll walk you through it quickly to refresh your memory. So the Kerberos authentication process begins with the user performing an initial authentication step. The user takes a timestamp of the current time and encrypts it with a key generated from the user's credential material, usually the password. That Encrypted timestamp is sent to the domain controller in an AS REC, an authentication service request. The domain controller receives that message and validates it by making sure that it is decrypted successfully with the key you would expect the user to use and that the timestamp is current. And if it all checks out, the domain controller is, uh, is happy and it pulls the user's information from the directory. Then the domain controller generates a, a ticket granting ticket, or TGT for short. That ticket granting ticket contains the user's username, the user's security identifier, and the security identifiers of all the groups of which the user is a member. Then the domain controller encrypts this TGT with a secret key generated from the password of the built-in Kerabit TGT account. It's a special account that every domain has. And only domain controllers have a copy of those keys generated from the password of this account. 
the domain controller returns this TGT to the user in an AS rep, in a response. And now let's say that the user wants to authenticate to some resource, say a file server. The user can't just present this TGT to the file server because the file server can't decrypt it. The file server wouldn't know what to do with it. So instead, the user must exchange the TGT for a service ticket encrypted with a key that the file server has. So the user sends the TGT to the domain controller in a TGS request, ticket granting service request. The domain controller decrypts the TGT and validates it. If it decrypted successfully, if it's not expired, the domain controller is happy. And then the domain controller is going to copy the information from the TGT to the new service ticket. And I'll emphasize here that the information is copied from the TGT to the new service ticket rather than pulled from the directory. It will come into play when we discuss ticket forgery attacks in a moment. This new service ticket is encrypted using another secret key generated from the password of the service account. So in our example, that would be the password of the file server. And it is sent back to the user in a TGS thread, a response. And now the user can finally authenticate to the file server by sending an app break application request containing the service ticket to the file server. The file server can decrypt and validate this service ticket. If it decrypted successfully and it's not expired, then the file server is happy. Uh, the user is who they claim to be. Authentication is done. It's not the end of the story, though. Uh, the file server can now make an authorization decision whether the user is permitted to access the file server or not based on the information in the ticket. And there is no communication between the file server and the domain controller. All these decisions, authentication and authorization, are made based on the information in the ticket alone. So I think it's a clever authentication protocol. I like it. This is an overview of the uh, Kerberos authentication process. I want to make a note and a couple of observations. The first note is that the service ticket is good only for uh, the service it is intended for. So the file server in our example. If the user wanted, wants to uh, authenticate to another file server, for example, the user will have to go through the TGS exchange again to obtain a new service ticket encrypted with another secret key uh, because every file server, every service account has a different password. Now let's make a very obvious observation. The domain controller is very central to this process. It has access to uh, all the user accounts credentials or the all the service accounts credentials. It's at the center of things. Another observation is that the TGT is very central. If um, a, if a, once the user obtains a TGT, the user can use the TGT to authenticate uh, to any service they like. The TGT is encrypted using the Kerbit TGT account, as a reminder, and only domain controllers have access to that, to those keys, again, putting the domain controllers at the center. Now, what happens if the Kerbit TGT keys are compromised? If an attacker can put their hands on the Caribbean TGT keys, the attacker can make their own TGTs and put inside the TGTs whatever information they like, whatever security identifiers, whatever group memberships they like, and ultimately authenticate as any user to any on-prem uh, service. Uh, the reason for that is that the information from the TGT propagates to service tickets in the TGS exchange. And this is the infamous golden ticket attack, which I'm sure many of you have heard of before. And the, that is the reason the Caribbean TGT keys are so sensitive. They are the keys to the kingdom, so to speak. And so they must be protected accordingly. And that can generate uh, some interesting challenges. Let's say an organization needs to deploy directory services in some remote physical location with inadequate physical security. Or in other words, 
the need to authenticate users in a place where in a place that is not trustworthy enough for a domain controller. Some examples are branch offices, retail stores, mine sites, clouds, hint, hint. So Microsoft came up with a creative solution, and that is the read-only domain controller, or RODC for short. As the name suggests, the RODC does not have write access to the directory. Um, so it can't change objects, it can't change passwords. It has only a filtered copy of the directory, leaving out any um, sensitive attributes. Now, one of the key roles of that RODC is to authenticate users. And of course, the RODC cannot authenticate users without accessing their credentials. But we don't want to let the RODC access the credentials of all users. The RODC is not trustworthy enough for that. So instead, every RODC has its own password replication policy that determines which accounts may have their passwords replicated to the RODC and which accounts may not. It is governed by two lists, an allow list and a deny list. It's pretty self-explanatory if a user can have their password replicated to the RODC if they are on the allow list and they are not on the deny list. If for whatever reason the user is on both lists, the deny list takes precedence and password replication is denied, which is the secure thing to do. This password replication policy ideally should be implemented in a way that allows all user and service accounts that operate in the same location as the RODC to have their passwords replicated to that RODC. Now, when the RODC authenticates a user, the RODC needs to, of course, generate a TGT for the user. That's the first step. The TGT is encrypted using the Kerbi TGT keys, and they are the keys to the kingdom. We don't want the RODC to have the Kerbi TGT keys. So instead, every RODC has its own version of the Kerbi TGT keys, and that is what the RODC uses to encrypt TGTs. When an RODC generates um, a TGT, we call it a partial TGT, and users can use those partial TGTs to obtain service tickets uh, from the RODC, as long as the RODC has the password for the service account that they want to authenticate to. Otherwise, the RODC, even though, even though the RODC really wants to help, it doesn't have the credential material, the keys to encrypt the, ticket, the service ticket. When that happens, the RODC refers the user to a full domain controller or a writable domain controller. Um, and the writable domain controller will accept a partial TGT under one condition. The user must be in the RODC's allow list. Or in other words, the RODC has no business uh, generating partial TGTs for users it can't authenticate, and it can't authenticate a user if it doesn't have their password. One last note I'll make here about partial and full TGTs is that there is a, a mechanism that allows users to take their partial TGT and upgrade them for a, to a full TGT, to exchange a partial TGT for a full TGT. And this is done simply by sending a TGS request to a full domain controller asking uh, for a service ticket to the Caribbean TGT account, and that will perform that exchange. I'll pass it all over to Daniel to discuss uh, Cloud Caribou's trust. All right, so you all got that, right? Yeah, all of it. Um, so this is kind of, the, the RODC portion is important because that's how Cloud Kerberos Trust is implemented under the hood. So when you set up a Cloud Kerberos Trust, what's gonna happen is a, a virtual RODC is gonna be created, and there's gonna be a, a new KRB TGT password, and that's gonna be synced up to Azure AD. So that's gonna be synced up to Azure AD, so when you authenticate, you know, use uh, Windows Hello for Business, you authenticate, you can actually get your Kerberos tickets and authenticate on-prem 
without ever using a password. But I want you to think about the implications of this because this is kind of like the nugget of the talk. This is the core of it. You just took some key material, some credential material, or sorry, key material, and you put it up in the cloud. And that key material is, can, can forge any parcel TGT for any user on-prem. So you effectively deleted the security boundary between on-prem and cloud. Now, as Alad mentioned, there's a password replication policy for most RODCs, um, and they're usually pretty limited. It's usually limited to the users at that branch site, right? But for Azure AD, um, we went on pure, like, full-on blacklist, right? So we allow all users by default, and then there's a specific set of, like, all the fun users that are blocked, right? Like schema admins, domain admins, et cetera, all the ones that you, like, want as an attacker. And so, in theory, let's say we, we compromise the cloud and we have full control. We could, in theory, forge partial TGTs for any user, no doubt. But when we go to exchange them, you know, the domain controls can be like, no, you can't do any one of these, right? So then the question is, does there exist non-synced users that are not on that blacklist? Because if there are, the theory is, if we compromise the cloud, we can forge partial TGTs for those non-synced users, and we can authenticate them as them. So even though these users are not synced up to Azure AD, we can authenticate as those users. So the first, the, the, the first approach, we wanted to test this theory, right? And the very first approach was, okay, well, let's try to obtain this key. You know, there's this special KRB TGT that gets synced up to the cloud. If we're global admin in Azure AD, which is like, you know, org admin in AWS, I know it's the AWS heavy crowd. Um, if we're like global admin, can we get this key somehow? And so what we did was we looked at AAD Connect. And um, so AD Connect is the, the, the software that's responsible for syncing users between on-prem and cloud. So we looked at that, we reverse engineered it. It's all in .NET, so it's kind of easy. I don't want to say easy, that's not true. It's easier. Um, and what's happening is that that password is being encrypted with a private key to which we don't have the public key, right? The public key is somewhere up in Azure AD. There's no graph API. There's no APIs that we're aware of to obtain this password. So we thought, okay, even if we could get this password, um, that's, mic that's likely on the Microsoft side of that split responsibility model um, that would most likely be a bug that we'd file, they'd fix it, we wouldn't have a cool talk, right? So the, the next thought was, okay, so we can't get this special key that we want to forge partial TGTs, so what if we change the password? What if we go, uh, you know, find some API where we can change that, that password for that KRB TGT account that gets synced up to the cloud, right? And there are APIs to do this, and you can do it as a global admin, the problem is that if you do that, the partial TGTs that have already been uh, issued will be invalidated. And these are somewhat long living, right? Um, I, I'm gonna make it up if I, I, I'd be lying if I told you how long it were, like how long they lived, but I think it's like in the matter of weeks, right? So you'd break a lot of on-premise on premises functionality if you were to set this. And as attackers, like, we don't want that, right? We don't wanna draw that kind of attention. So. Maybe this is a good denial of service, but it's certainly not a good like boundary hop. So if you remember, if you're paying attention, there were three things that we had to cover, and we covered two. So here's the third one. And it's, it's pretty simple, um, but it, we do need to cover it. So um, there's this concept of syncing users between on-premises and Azure AD. And the idea is that um, you know, if I create a new user and it gets synced up to the cloud, there's two, there's basically two representations of that user. Now, if I, let's say, let's say for example, I want to change the, the, the username or the UPN, and I change, maybe my, like, maybe I legally change my name. How does on-premises know which object to change up in the cloud? True Microsoft fashion, they just said, let's throw a UUID at it. Um, so they have this thing called a source anchor, and the source anchor is essentially a base 64 encoding of the, the user object ID, right? And then that maps to a cloud anchor. And this is important because we can change properties um, on either side 
and they will get synced to the other user. But for the cloud side, we can modify properties um, that might not translate back, um, as we'll see. So at this point, um, it was a lot that had the idea, okay, so we can't, we can't get this password to forge TGTs. We don't really want to set the password. What if we find a sync user that like no one cares about? Let's call this user sync. And we have the on, like the uh, SID, so um, the on-premise security identifier of a non-synced user, one that we want to target. Let's call this user non-synced. So let's set the property on the synced user in the cloud to the SID of the non-synced user. And what's going to happen, if you remember how like all that Kerberos song and dance works, things are copied over. So the thought is, we're going to get Azure AD to sign a partial TGT with that non-synced SID in the ticket. And then that ticket information is going to get copied over. We're going to get our Kerberos ticket for a non-sync user, effectively bridging this gap between Azure AD and on-prem. Right. So ultimately, we're going to authenticate as a non-sync user. So to do this um, takes a little bit of trickery. Um, most of the work has been done for us, fortunately. So um, to, to modify this on-premises security identifier and the SAM account name, those are the two things we have to change. Um, you can't do this through like the normal Microsoft Graph API, um, but there is like a sync API, and it's a very undocumented one, right? And so, I don't know. I don't know if I ever would have gotten this far. I probably wouldn't have looked into the API that much, but um, there's another project out there called AAD Internals. Um, I'm by this guy named uh, Dr. Azure AD. Amazing project. This API was already like quasi-documented in that project, and there was already like a PowerShell commandlet to set some properties. So we really had like the heavy lifting done for us. And another thing to note is that in order to use the Sync API, you have to pretty much be a global administrator. Um, there's another role called hybrid identity administrator, which is like almost just as privileged. So we, we are saying, yes, you have to, you really have to like be privileged in this cloud environment. This isn't like a, a privilege escalation. This is a boundary violation, right? So run it down one more time before I show demo. Um, as global admin, we modify these on-premises SID for a cloud synced user. And the on-premises SID is go going to be modified to be that of a non-synced user. We then authenticate. Uh, we basically do a device enrollment, because um, Windows, Windows Hello for Business is all about device enrollment. Um, and I'm going to, like in the demo too, I'm going to gloss over these steps because um, uh, I don't want to talk about them. <laughs> uh, more. Uh, there will be a there will be a blog post uh, where we'll go into like the technical nitty gritty, but it's mostly just like how the encryption primitives happen. So it's not really relevant to the talk. Um, but we're going to enroll like a virtual device. We're going to get some certificates. We're eventually going to get a partial TGT that is for a, a non-synced user, right? So essentially a forged one. So here's a demo. Um, and I'll kind of walk you through this from an attacker's perspective, right? So let's hope I keep hitting the play button properly. Because it's small. Come on, guy. And we're not going. There we go. Okay. So the green terminal represents, by the way, this is going to go fast. Um, the green terminal represents our global admin. And you'll see here, I don't know if you can actually see this very well or not. But um, we basically just got the SID of our non-synced user, right? So we, we did like an LDAP query, right? Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to stage this to set the property on the synced user. So this is Azure Portal. And the one thing I want you to note here, I don't know. Yeah, you, you there's no way you can see this. Um, there's, <laughs> there's a same account name, and it's called synced. It's down here. Yeah, I can even like try to. Sh so take my word for it. There's this user called synced down here. And the SID ends in 1122. So we're going to change that, right? So we're going to use this AAD internals commandlet to change this property. Um, and we're going to change it to that of a non sync user, one that should not be in the cloud, right? And I just went right past it. Oh boy. This is what I'm talking about with the, with the play bar. Let's go, guy. Come on. Oh, they're not going to let me do it, are they? 
Nope. It's just either all or nothing with this thing. All right. So I'll talk through it. Um, there was going to be a lot more pausing, but we'll just kind of run straight through it. So recap, we are modifying some SIDs, yada, yada, yada. Um, there's going to be a red terminal. That's going to be the context of the uh, user that's line of sight to the domain controller. Right, so remember there was two assumptions here. One was that we're global administrator. The other was that we have line of sight. And what you're going to see um, when we refresh this page here is that the, the name is going to be different. It's going to be called not synced, and the SID's going to be different, even though the user in the top left says synced. Right, and then from here on out is a bunch of cryptographic primitives. Um, and we'll, we'll post this online too so you can like pause it and read it. But essentially here, we're going to obtain a Kerberos ticket at the end and it's going to be for user not synced. So this essentially is a full demonstration of us hopping that boundary. So we went from uh, a cloud admin and we're able to, to cross that trust boundary to do something we shouldn't do. Right? And this, this payoff is going to be super underwhelming because you're not going to read it. That's okay. That's okay. You can take my word for it. Um, and there, there's like some massaging that we have to do with like key material and exchanging Kerberos tickets and whatnot. Um, and this will be more for the blog post to like actually walk through how you do this. So what we're highlighting here is we have a ticket for not synced. So that's demo one. So what we did was we violated this trust boundary, right? We went from a synced account, modified it, authenticated as a non-synced account. But that's not very fun. Because uh, we just showed you that we can authenticate as a user, right? Um, cool, big deal. Like that's that's a gotcha. That's a you know teehee, Like your 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 design decision was not good enough. Um, so what we want to do is show that we can do this to to take over to become domain admin, right? That's the cool part. Um, and remember, there's there's a subset of non-synced users that belong to this blacklist, right? Those are the ones that we can't exchange this partial TGT for. So we're curious, do there exist non-synced accounts that aren't on the blacklist that are fun, like that are cool, right? Um, and so it turns out there is one account that we're aware of. I'm sure there's more, but the one that we picked was this MSOL underscore number number letter random account, right? And this is created when you install ED Connect. And AD Connect is responsible for syncing users on-prem to the cloud. And, uh, and so just by the nature of the job of this account, uh, it has the permissions to see, like, obtain all the password hashes for all the users in the domain and sync them. And it'll actually like, make post requests to the sync API so that Azure AD knows what the password hashes are. Right? So this is a very privileged user. Um, and it's there anytime you use AD Connect. And most, like, most importantly, it's not on that blacklist, right? So, new attack, and uh, knowing that I don't have pause, I'm gonna have to talk real fast. Uh, what we're doing here is, you, are you all familiar with Mimikatz? So yeah, we're uh, doing a Mimikatz DC sync first, right? And this is in the context of our synced user, right? And so you'll see we get in, well, you won't see, I'll tell you. We'll get an error code of five, which is an access denied in, in Windows land, right? So this is kind of like a trust us, uh, or yeah, we do it first, it fails. We're gonna do our same attack, and you'll see. Uh, we're gonna dump, we're gonna dump cr credentials, and then uh, of course it hits us today, like we better delete this account before we show it live. <laughs> so like two hours ago, I'm up uh, deleting all these accounts from Azure AD. So at this point, we are um, pulling off the same attack. So the only difference here is we're replacing the SID of that, that, that dummy user not synced with this actual MSOL account, um, which is installed anytime you use AD Connect, right? And here we have um, TGS uh, request successful, and we did this thing called pass the ticket. So now our authenticated session is acting as this MSOL user. We're going to hop back into Mimikatz, and we're going to see some password hashes just dumped to screen. It's going to be sweet. Cool. And those are a whole bunch of password. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate it. Um, yeah. So you'll see, like, um, there's some ad, like, we have admin password hashes dumped and whatnot. So this would complete the attack, right? At this point, 
we could authenticate as a domain administrator and, and fully prove out that we went from, from, went from cloud to on-prem. Uh, I guess I keep wanting to use the word own, uh, and I know it's like we're using dominance instead. So we went from cloud dominance to on-prem dominance, right? Uh, we did disclose this to Microsoft, uh, to MSRC, right? Their response, to accomplish this requires a certain amount of privileges. So that, that is very true. Uh, it does require a lot of privileges. Um, and there is public knowledge already. They are linked to um, an AAD internals post. Um, but the attack was, was different. It was opposite. It was, going, it was modifying on-premise um, identifiers to go from on-prem to cloud. So it was almost the exact opposite direction, and the nature of it was a little different. Um, so I guess you can kind of guess where we're going with this. Uh, they said they're not going to fix this, right? Um, and and frankly, like, I I, I don't know. I, I, I kind of agree. I don't know how much they could, because this is such a fundamental design decision, right? This it's and it's it's a good feature in its. Um, it provides a lot of convenience. You don't have to manage your own PKI, right? So there's a lot of benefits. But I think as a as, as a cloud administrator, or a, if you if you're in charge of your cloud environment, there are some mitigations and and you know just in general some trade offs that you need to be aware of, right? Which is why we're highlighting it. So to uh, to a lot's going to cover some mitigations because um, there are ways to fix this, right? We're not just going to come up here and say, well, oh, tee like we got you. Um, there are ways to fix this, right? All right, so we're gonna suggest a couple of uh, things that you can do. One, let's start by addressing the root cause of this issue, which is that the domain users group is in the, uh, it's in AAD's RODC's uh, allow list. Basically saying that uh, it's an allow by default policy or a blacklisting approach, meaning that um, if it's not explicitly denied, then it's allowed. This blacklisting approach has been frowned upon in security best practices for many years now, and the opposite approach, the whitelisting approach, is preferred. In order to implement a whitelisting approach here, you will have to uh, replace the domain users group in the allow list with a new security group in your on-prem AD that contains all the synced accounts. This is a relatively easy thing to do because the account synchronization policy comes down to an LDAP filter. So you can even write a script and run it at a certain interval and it will solve your problem. Another approach, the opposite approach, involves improving the blacklist, uh, making sure that all privileged on-prem principles are in the deny list. This is much harder to do because it's not just an LDAP filter. Uh, you need to do some attack path analysis to discover all those principles that have a path to domain dominance. There are tools that can help you with that. Bloodhound is the most notable one. It's gonna be more challenging though because you need to maintain and monitor that continuously. And again, it's not just an LDAP filter, there's a much more complicated um, logic that you need to implement there. There are some commercial products that can help there, like Bloodhound Enterprise. Ultimately, a combination of both of these mitigations is the ideal solution. The first mitigation uh, it makes, makes sure that um, AD is allowed to issue on-prem TGTs only to synced accounts, while the second mitigation uh, blocks AAD from issuing on-prem TGTs to privileged on-prem accounts. And this combination makes sure that even if you made the, gra the grave mistake of synchronizing to AAD a privileged on-prem account, this account, th this attack will not be viable. Other attacks might still be viable, so make sure you don't uh, make that mistake. Uh, but this combination of both mitigations is uh, ideal. All right. So, last slide. Uh, so, just a few takeaways. Um, the boundary between Azure AD, cloud, and on prem is just becoming weaker, right? Um, my prediction is that um, this will eventually erode. So, as cloud administrators, that's something to be aware of. 
And especially if you choose to use Cloud Kerberos Trust, which I personally would, just be aware that there are trade-offs, right? There, uh, you do have like key material that's getting synced up to the cloud that's very sensitive, and you're exchanging a cryptographic boundary primitive, like a, like a trust anchor, for a blacklist, right? So make sure your lists are good. Uh, bonus prediction, my guess is that someday Microsoft will just be like, use Azure AD. <laughs> um, I do want to show one uh, thanks just to the resources um, that we use to kind of build up this talk. Um, Microsoft actually has really good community engagement. There was a talk called Level 400 on 425, and they did like an hour on Cloud Kerberos and Windows Hello for Business. That was key. Like the fact that they're open is really awesome. And the AAD internals, and thanks to MSRC. Um, we will blog about this. We, we have a SpectreOps blog. Um, you can follow me. I go by HotNops on Twitter, um, Salaj Shamir. And uh, yeah, I don't. I, I know we're running a little over. Were you good on questions? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Alrighty. So, so thanks for providing mitigations. Always appreciate that. And also thanks to Spectrops for all the work you've done on detection engineering. Now, with regards to detection engineering, have you looked into whether there whether there are ways to see if the specific attribute is updated in Azure Active Directory through those audit logs? Or if it can be detected in any way on Nash ready and not on on-prem AD logs? You know, that's a really good question. Um, I am not aware of any. So the question was, oh, you have a mic. Um, <laughs> I'm not aware of any events that are created from that sync API because remember that came from that came from pretty much an undocumented API. Um, because we we said, okay, well, this is an easy fix. This is something easy to mitigate. We didn't really spend a lot of time on how do you detect this because we usually like reserve those efforts for like chronic misconfigurations or things. Yeah. So thanks. Yeah, I, I, know I don't there, know. There are much. some on the user attributes updated, for instance. So it yeah, it'd be nice to look into. But thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? You're fine. Quick, quick question, and this is, is there a reason why Microsoft allows you to change the SID? Um, well, there's really no way to prevent it, because remember, um, we're abusing that sync API. So there is a, there's a program that runs, like usually on the domain controller, that says, like if you were to create a new user on-prem or on-premises, there, there is, has to be an API that's like where they can call out to Azure AD, yeah, Azure AD and say, hey, there's a new user created, and here's their SID, and here's their username, and so on and so forth. So really what you're doing is just abusing that API. I don't, I suppose there's, they could say, like, like, yeah, like, yeah they, they could say like, well, you can't change it, but I imagine there's got to be some scenario, I don't know a lot, if, Let's say that they did prevent that. Then our workaround would simply be, let's say we created a new user with that seed and game over. Like it wouldn't stop that attack. We would just create a new user. So I guess that's where like, if it's a read-only do domain controller, right? Am I able to create like, I so guess we'll a global administrator. Okay, I guess yeah, yeah. We're, we're basically going to pretend that yeah. a new user was created uh, on-prem with those attributes. Right on, appreciate it. Any other questions? I don't mind walking, by the way. <laughs> All right, thank you, Daniel and Alad. Really All appreciate right. it. Thanks, y'all.